administration for oversight agencies, intermediary organizations, state housing finance agencies, and multi-state organizations. Um, this is Shauna LaRue Marai from ICF. We are HUD's technical assistance provider um, to the Office of Housing Counseling, providing a series of webinars for um, oversight agencies. Bill McKee, would you like to provide the welcome? Thank you, Shauna. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the country you are, everybody. First of all, I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, and most importantly, for all the important work that you do in the field of housing counseling. As you know, last week HUD announced more than $1.4 million to support grants for 36 new grantees under the FY Supplemental NOPA published in April of this year as well as an additional $4.5 million to provide a second installment of FY15 funding for 271 grantees that received awards through the two-year FY14, FY15 NOFA published in March of 2014. We're currently in the process of sending out the award letters and grant agreements. Today's webinar will cover some key concepts regarding grant administration and specifically focus on helping intermediary state housing finance agencies and multi-state organizations administer their HUD housing counseling grant program. But it's important that you know that HUD will also hold a separate training in early July that is specific to the FY 2015 grant agreement that we're in the process of sending out. When you receive your grant agreements, it's important that you read them carefully. And again, we urge you to attend the FY 15 grant agreement training also that's occurring in early July. We'll be announcing the date and time of that training in the very near future. So right now I'd like to turn it over to Shona Morella who will tell us more about today's grant administration training. Shona? Okay, thank, thank you, Bill. Um, again, I'm Shauna LaRue Mariah. I work at ICF International. We are um, the Office of Housing Counseling's technical assistance provider bringing you this webinar series. Um, we have um, a couple of HUD speakers as well as uh, subcontractors to ICF. So, Aisha, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, everyone uh, on the West Coast, and good afternoon to everyone um, in the East Coast and in the Midwest. Uh, my name is Aisha Williams, and I am a uh, the managing director at ADW Associates, and I'm a subcontractor to ICF International, uh, working with them on this uh, project for. Uh, HUD oversight agencies. Okay, thank you, Aisha. Jason? Thank you, Shauna. Good day, everyone. This is Jason Zavala. I'm the president uh, of Mitigate Inc., and I also am going to be subcontracting for ICF on this particular function. Okay, great. Thank you. Stephanie? Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Williams. I work in the Office of Housing Counseling and the Office of Policy and Grant Administration. And I'm glad to be here and hope to be able to answer any questions and provide you with helpful information. Thanks. Thank you. Carolyn? Hello, everyone. I am Carolyn Hogans, and I am the Division Deputy Director of the Office of Oversight and Accountability, uh, and I'm located in the Atlanta office. Okay, thank you. Um, Chantel, why don't you go ahead and walk people through the two ways in which they can ask questions during today's webinar. Okay, thank you, Shauna. Um, if you are joining us today um, through your, uh, the audio, through your telephone or your computer, you can use the uh, question box that's found on your tool panel. Um, you can write your question in there and at certain times throughout the webinar, um, someone will uh, read your question out loud and um, we will answer that question. If you are joining us today through the uh, audio through your computer, um, we ask that you um, Submit your question through the question box uh, to avoid uh, that feedback. Um, but you also have another option if you're joining us through the audio on your telephone. You can raise your hand. So by using the raise your hand function, it alerts me that you have a question to ask. And I can unmute you, and you can verbally ask your question. So there are two ways to answer your question through the question box, no matter how you are joining us today um, and which way. Um, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. 
Okay, great. And um, this is just to remind you, this is where you type in the questions here in the box that's provided on this screen. Um, but if you have questions after today's webinar, you can always write in to housing.counseling at HUD.gov um, to get your questions answered. Okay, um, so as a reminder, this is part of a, of a um, six-part webinar series that we started last October. Um, we provided a webinar on just basically the oversight of network, so it was roles and responsibilities of oversight agencies. We also did network monitoring. We had one in December. We repeated that session in February of this year on what is network monitoring and all the um, pieces of quality control plan, that type of thing. Today is the webinar on grant administration. And then we have a couple of upcoming uh, webinars as well. No dates have been decided at this point, but you might look out for those on the Housing Counseling Listserv, one on uh, the HUD criteria around uh, agency eligibility and evaluation, right-sizing your network, either growing your network or shrinking your network, depending upon what's going on, and then one on performance reviews. Okay, I will um, turn it over to Aisha to kind of talk through um, today's agenda. I'm okay. sorry, Jason, to turn it to talk about today's agenda. Uh, no, you had, you had it right. Um, thank you so much, oh, sorry. Donna. Um, and this is Aisha. So in today's webinar, we are on um, grant administration. We are going to start with a discussion about how grant administration aligns with concepts we previously discussed in the network monitoring webinar. In part two of today's webinar, we will discuss some foundational concepts and key definitions in grant administra administration. Um, we'll also highlight any key role for grant administrators at oversight agencies. In part three of today's webinar, we will describe the seven steps of the grant administration life cycle. This includes some basic operational activities as well as recommended strategies. And again, throughout our discussion of the grant administration life cycle, we will highlight key roles and responsibilities of grant administrators at oversight agencies. Some key topics that we'll cover include how to use your grant application at, as the beginning guide for the entire implementation of your housing counseling grant, understanding and leveraging the relationship between the grant award, performance and budget projections, and the grant agreement, leveraging required reporting as an opportunity to ensure that activities were performed as outlined in your grant application, and in a high quality manner. Opportunities to improve the grant implementation process by using your ELOC system, as well as things like strategies for performance reviews. We will wrap up by, by highlighting common grant implementation mistakes and reviewing key responsibilities in grant administration. And then finally, we'll present some additional resources on this topic. I want to uh, just note for everyone that this training uh, is not an exclusive webinar, rather, is not an exclusive presentation on grant administration. There are a host of documents and prior presentations that cover the various aspects of grant administration, which is a really broad topic. And the training today is designed to instruct oversight agencies on particular rules and regulations out is not designed to, I'm sorry, today's training is not designed to instruct oversight agencies on particular rules and regulations outlined in the grant agreement. So again, this does not replace the training on the grant agreement. As Bill mentioned at the beginning, HUD will hold a separate training in July that covers the specific items in the 2015, uh, fiscal year 2015 grant agreement. And again, today we just want to provide some strategies and tips that will help you as oversight agencies achieve efficiencies in your grant uh, program, implementation, and operations. So let's begin with a part one and review of just a, key, a few key concepts uh, from prior webinars, including a reminder of who is the appropriate audience for today's webinar. You can see on your screen the graphic that illustrates the relationship between HUD agencies that have oversight responsibility for housing counseling networks, 
and agencies that are part of Housing Counseling Network. On the top row, you can see that HUD has accountability for authority over and oversees everyone else. In the second row, you can see that HUD partners with oversight agencies to administer and run the counseling program. These agencies include, as has been mentioned already, intermediaries, state housing finance agencies, and multi-state organizations. There's also some limited applications to local housing counseling agencies that have branches. And then finally, in the third row, you see agencies that are part of Housing Counseling Network. These include branches, funded affiliates, and unfunded affiliates. So who are we talking to today? The audience for today's webinar, again, is oversight agencies, and particularly grant administrators at oversight agencies. Uh, the webinar, the things we will talk about will pretty much apply to subgrantees, also known as funded affiliates. For purposes of today, we are going to say subgrantees. There will be limited alignment to unfunded affiliates, but we won't actually go through and, and specify uh, all that much where we're talking about unfunded affiliates. Uh, this webinar complements the existing grant agreement, uh, OMB Omni Circular, uh, two CFR uh, label of grant agreement, performance reporting toolkit, as well as other webinars and things conducted by the Office of Housing Counseling and Booth Management Inc. Okay, so let's, let's, let's move on to a review of how network monitoring and grant administration align with each other. You'll recall from previous webinars that there are four key categories of network monitoring. That includes ongoing monitoring, periodic monitoring, financial monitoring, and technical support. One key requirement that we discussed in the network monitoring webinar was that oversight agencies are responsible for collecting and reviewing the 9902 at least quarterly at the time of reporting and prior to re providing these reports to HUD. In addition, HUD expects that oversight agencies will conduct some level of review of counseling and education activities in the sub of the subgrantees uh, activities as they're recorded in the client management system. When you're reviewing the client management system, what you want to be looking for is that the activities recorded accurately reflect what's in the subgrantee's work plans and demonstrate that there is consistent and quality data entry as well as quality counseling education services and activities. Oversight agencies are also responsible for collecting and verifying personnel activities, charges, and documentation. And, you're, and you're, uh, finally on this slide, you are expected to collect and verify forms that, that document any personnel activity charges. Continuing with ongoing monitoring and financial monitoring, oversight agencies must verify that the information represented in HUD's HDS system is correct with regard to their network agencies. Key verification questions that we want to remind you to ask are, have there been any changes in the network agency's ad address or personnel? Or were counseling and activities, were counseling and education activities uploaded on time? Oversight agencies must also stay uh, up to date on various accounting requirements and practices as they apply to the grant. So for example, you want to be sure that you are looking, you're performing accounting of administrative costs and verifying that there's documentation of the expenses that people are billing to the grant. Oversight agencies should ensure that their, that their subgrantees' activities um, in terms of internal, and, uh, of internal accounting and, and financial activities 
that they are in compliance with 2 CFR 200 omnicircular on uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for federal awards. And that was just a long way to say that uh, the, current, the current Code of Federal Regulations and the omnicircular uh, was, was condensed. It, it basically combined eight previously separate sets of OMB guidance into one, into one place. And so you have to remember that all of the financial and accounting activities, all of the documentation, um, uh, direct and indirect costs, all of those things need to be uh, properly compliant and aligned with the guidance outlined in, that, in the omnicircular. And there's also a different additional information that you can find out about these particular uh, costs and activities. Again, uh, OH, the Office of Housing Counseling and Booth Management, Inc. conducted a webinar training on the omnicircular. And you can see the link to that training on your screen for additional information. In addition to the ongoing monitoring and financial monitoring activities that we just covered, here are some grant administration activities that also apply to periodic monitoring and technical support. Providing training and technical support concerning the information that we've been covering and that we'll cover today is very, very important. So for example, you want to provide the technical support and, and training to address proper expense documentation and reporting procedures, as well as providing examples of what appropriate reporting and documentation looks like. This helps avoid serious errors that take significant corrective action when reports are due, and it can avoid last-minute corrective action at the time of an audit or when, when HUD conducts a performance review or when one of HUD's third-party auditors comes in to do an audit. You want to be uh, checking, you want to be checking work plans to be sure that, again, anything that uh, the agencies have, have uploaded and reported are, that they are consistent with what's in their work plans. And then you want to follow up and follow through and communicate regularly with your agencies. Now, this may seem like a soft feature, but follow up one-on-one -on -one throughout the grant cycle, not just during reporting and not just at the end of the grant cycle are all really key to help keep everyone on track. And you should develop resource materials, as I mentioned, checklists, templates, um, standard operating procedures to help everyone implement the grant in a, in a manner that's quality, or high quality and consistent and delivers consumers with the, the level of service that HUD would want for their program. Excellent. Thank you, Aish. So now it's going to be time for a pop quiz. And in a moment, I'd like to ask HUD if they have anything to add. And while we do the quiz, we'll take some questions. So we'd like to encourage you to submit them through the, the control panel options that were previously identified. So I'll, I'll begin. Which of these required network monitoring activities is relevant to grant administration? Is it A, collect and review forms HUD 9902s, B, review counseling and education activities reflected in CMS, C, collect and verify personnel activity charges and documentation, D, monitor financial performance and use of pass-through funds, or E, all of the above. Once you know your answer, we'll ask you to please click and then we'll discuss the right answer in a moment. Chad, did you have anything to add while we are while people are clicking their answers on the screen? Yes, hi, this is Stephanie Williams. So I, I can um, just highlight a few things. You covered some, some really good information, and so I'm just going to touch on um, a few of those points. Uh, Aisha mentioned booth management and, and its training on the um, 
omnicircular, different topics. I'm sure that everyone has attended at least one or at least one of the trainings, which, which are our archives. So if you've missed one, it's a good idea to go back and, and, um, and listen to those uh, presentations. In the grant uh, administration and grant agreement, grant agreement rather, um, training that uh, the Office of Housing Counseling will provide in, in the coming weeks once the grant award packages um, are, are mailed, it would be, it's always good to, to pay attention and, and participate in those meetings. One of the things that we'll highlight during that training is some of the ways that the grant agreement has changed in connection with the Omnicircular, so it just sort of carries through some of the things that Booth has already covered, but you'll begin to see it in your grant award documents um, starting with the fiscal year 15 grant agreement. So please um, kind of be prepared to see that. Um, I also wanted to mention this is one of the items on the pop quiz. Everyone knows that 9902 reporting is, is, is critical. It provides information about the housing counseling program. It justifies the funding that we request and, um, and just sort of, sort of shows the need for the program, the client served, and is, um, is meant to be a good picture of the housing counseling activity. To the extent that you have comments, concerns, ideas, questions about 9902 reporting challenges that you have, please continue to submit those to the Office of Housing Counseling. Right now, we have a group who is um, working to find ways to um, as assist with the reporting more, uh, providing you more guidance and, and information about completing your 9902, submitting the information timely, um, to the extent that there are questions or problems that you face with the 9902 reporting, we're, we're trying to address that. So um, just know that more kind of guidance about the 9902 reporting is, um, is in the works. And um, I think that's all I really wanted to, to highlight based on what you've already said. I'll, I'll leave it for any of my colleagues who might want to add something. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Chantel, have we captured our responses? Uh, yes, we're at 70 percent um, voted already, so I'll go ahead and close this now. And now I'm sharing it. Excellent. Thank you. So from what we can see, nearly everyone had identified that all of the above was the correct answer. So we were looking for answer E. And really noteworthy to this whole process, and Stephanie certainly alluded to much of this, is that successful oversight will require a significant number of tasks and collaboration with your network. So you have to make sure that you have built a response to each of these activities that are identified here. We did have one question that somebody has written in. If you um, could take one of the written questions on part one. Is it true that HUD has changed the requirement personal activity charges? I assume they mean for personal activity charges. Is it true that HUD has changed the requirement for personal activity charges? This, this is Stephanie Williams. Uh, the, the, answer is, um, the answer is that HUD hasn't changed the requirement. The requirement um, was, was changed as part of the, the omnicircular that OMB uh, published and that became effective in December. Um, the omnicircular no longer requires personnel activity reports, PARs, as we've known them. They are acceptable but not but not required, and so our our grant agreement will um, uh, reflect the the language in the omnicircular that um, 
specifies what what will be needed and what's required for personnel expenses reporting. Um, so that you'll see in the grant agreement, and and we'll provide some some training on that in the upcoming grant agreement training. The other thing that we are working on is to provide um, a template of sorts to um, outline what would be needed for personnel expenses reporting. I don't want to call it PARS anymore because uh, we're, we're trying to kind of move away from that since that uh, we have um, that guidance from the from the omnicircular. So the the long the long answer is that there is a change in personnel expenses reporting in that PARS as we've known them is no longer required and HUD is just um, going in that in that uh, direction as a result of what the omnicircular states. Okay, that's perfect, Stephanie. That answered the, the follow-up question as well. Thank you. So part two. Thank you, Shauna. So now, in part two, we'll start covering some basic definitions and key facts that grant administrators need to know. These items will also help to inform the seven steps of grant administration which we'll also cover in part three. So to start, here are some of our key points in our basic definitions. And the first one is about how to engage your specialist. Monitoring representatives from HUD provide a myriad of focus areas and skill sets. Oversight agencies should utilize all of these supports in order to ensure proper guidance and information. You'll also find that some HUD representatives may serve in multiple roles. Grant administration covers many facets of implementation of the housing counseling grant received by an organization with network oversight responsibilities. What's different than other housing counseling agencies is the agency is overseeing its network of partners. On your screen, you should see some key HUD representatives defined with whom you will regularly interface. Your government technical representative, or your GTR, is the HUD staff person that monitors the activities of housing counseling grantees. This individual is responsible for technical and financial oversight and evaluation of the grantee's performance under this agreement. The GTR reviews and monitors the grantee's work performance, payment requests, and reports. They may also be referred to as the HUD's point of contact, or POC. Your government technical monitor, or GTM, is the HUD staff person that monitors the activities of the HUD counseling grantees. This individual may be appointed to assist the government technical representative. The GTR may delegate duties to the GTM. And likewise, the GTM may also be referred to as the HUD point of contact. The assigned point of contact interfacing, when it comes to reporting and general requiries, they use a central point of contact if there are performance review findings, communication issues, reporting and grant payment problems, and regulation and policy interpretations. Along with the grant administration function, there are specific point of contact players within HUD that will help to inform and guide successful execution of the grant agreements if any critical problems arise. You should recognize the Housing Counseling Agreement as your NOFA grant agreement. And alignment and use of the signed agreement is, cohes is critical to a cohesive strategy. While this is not the singular governing document, it holds much of the advisement for core network application. Depending on an agency's goals, some grantees will expand the agreement to a more comprehensive task and procedure. However, please note, omissions are not recommended. And remember that in addition to the HUD representatives, your role is part of the HUD Housing Counseling Handbook 7610.1, Revision 5. And you have many players to coordinate with. Key to remember, contact your GTR first and use them as your primary point of contact. The roles provided by HUD are also identified in this handbook as monitors. 
as well as the housing counseling agency interfacing. And for additional information, you can seek the HUD Handbook 2210.17, which covers discretionary grant and cooperative agreement policies and procedures in Chapter 5. Additionally, we want to introduce you to some of your other systems that support you. For grant administrators, the HCS, your housing counseling system, is used to capture agency contact and counselor information, services, 9902 projection, projections, ID submission verifications, view awards, ARM submissions, which is the agency reporting module, or your CMS to HCS interface, and overall grant processing. The information that supports your communicating discrepancies or areas to provide technical support can come from the HCS user screens and should be viewed periodically. The client management system is used for electronic tracking and storage of services. The subgrantees use this platform to capture critical counseling and education data and to provide specifics, notations, and reporting on the services rendered. Housing counseling agencies are required to utilize a client management system that interfaces with HUD's HCS. And there is a list of approved client management systems. If an agency has a system not on the list, the oversight agency and the HUD counseling agency must work with the HUD point of contact to get the system approved. Agencies without an approved client management system should not be participating in the grant program. ELOX, the electronic line of credit control system, handles access and grant fund drawdowns. We'll be discussing this in greater detail as part of the grant lifecycle requirement element. And lastly here, we reiterate the 9902s, which report each of the HCA service analysis which includes demographics, services that have been acquired, outcomes, and more. Again, key to your success, grant administration staff should become thoroughly versed in reading and possibly troubleshooting any anomalous reporting activity. Now that we've covered some basic definitions, let's transition to discuss some key facts about grant administration. For our purposes, grant administration covers implementation of the HUD grant through an oversight agency's network. The oversight agency is responsible for managing the daily operation of its programs, meaning that partnering with network agencies does not relieve oversight agencies of its responsibility for production, performance, and compliance with its written agreement with HUD and other applicable laws. At the same time, housing counseling agencies are still responsible for properly managing their daily program operations in accordance with the guidelines and regulations that are set out in the grant agreement and other documents as required. The grant administrator should assist in setting uniform standards and best practices in managing their operations and implementing the HUD Housing Counseling Grant. Take time to explore and reinform on highlights of state and federal applicable laws for your network. And look to some of the prior presentations on grant agreements for additional implementation information. So now we'll move into part three. In this part, we will review the seven steps of the grant life cycle from application through performance reviews for oversight agencies. The seven steps noted in this graphic were previously identified in a grant agreement and oversight webinar. Effective compliance in grant administration encompasses all of the seven steps on this slide. And for the remainder of this presentation, we'll re revisit these steps in greater detail 
and discuss the administrative and oversight functions for oversight agencies associated with each of the steps. Our discussion will highlight these critical features of oversight agency responsibility and offer, where appropriate, some how-tos for conducting oversight activities. Oversight agencies should have established written protocols for all of these topics and hopefully today's presentation will help clarify what should be included in these protocols. Here is the same cycle elements in a list format. We will discuss each of them on our subsequent uh, slides. Aisha? Great, thank you so much, Jason. And so the way I'm gonna go through these, everyone, is I'm gonna start with some critical defining activities for each step, and then I'm going to talk about some tips and strategies that will help you streamline your implementation of those steps or make each step more efficient. So let's go ahead and begin with step number one, which, as Jason mentioned, is the NOFA application. So the critical and defining activities for the NOFA application include collecting and verifying subgrantee application data and submitting a network grant, a, a, an application to HUD on behalf of your entire network. Now I realize that some uh, some oversight agencies may not actually solicit uh, specific uh, applications from your network uh, every single grant cycle, uh, but there should be some process in which you are gathering information to be sure that um, what you are submitting on behalf of your network is uh, properly representative, uh, properly representing what your subgrantees um, intend to do under the grant. So what does it mean to verify your subgrantee's data? Well, this means taking a look and making sure that the information that they submitted and that you submitted um, are correct and that they um, all align. So there's a couple of questions that you need to ask. Number one, do the units add up? You know, has someone said that they are going to do five units of activity A and five units of activity B and then overall all of their units look like uh, 17 units? We know that five plus five is 10 and so you want to do those types of uh, just checks to make sure that the, that the units align. The next thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that the units make sense in terms of the agency's performance. So if you have an agency that has only done 10 units for the past two years, and now suddenly they're saying they're going to do 1,000 units, you need to ask yourself and ask the subgrantee, does that make sense given your prior production? And if, and if you say it does, how exactly do you plan to achieve that increase in productivity? You also want to make sure that the budget that they're, that they're putting in supports the performance that they're promising. So, uh, you know, if, if are, they, are they saying that they are going to, you know, produce a ton of units on a, on a shoestring budget, or are they saying that they're only going to produce a few, unit, a few units on a, a budget that's inappropriately large for the amount of production that they're planning to, to, to provide? And then lastly, you want to make sure that in looking at what your subgrantees have said they would do, you want to be sure that those activities sufficiently fulfill HUD's requirements. And so a good example that I like to use for this is affirmatively furthering fair housing activities. Because this is an area where there is uh, considerable variation on what folks might do. Again, um, on the first network, on the first network, uh, on the first oversight agency webinar that we did in this series, at the very end, and even on the last network monitoring series, we talked about uh, particularly, particular affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing activities that agencies could do. You want to be sure that uh, agencies have properly addressed all of these things, that those are included in their work plan, and again, that they comprehensively cover what HUD expects them to do in this area. So, you also want to be sure that the applicant agencies or the agencies that are joining your network through this application, so your subgrantees, that they either meet and exceed, meet or exceed HUD's approval criteria, or that they are actually HUD approved at the time of the application submission. The time to do this is not after you've already included them in your application and then you're 
staff wondering whether or not the agency is going to be compliant uh, with all of HUD's requirements. Speaking of compliance, the application is also the time to assess each applicant agency's compliance. So I'm not saying that you need to conduct a full performance review of each agency, but you definitely want to ask the question have there, have, concerning any compliance or audit findings or performance review findings even that they've had from past intermediaries or from HUD. And if there are some significant findings or concerns, you want to be sure that they've, they've sufficiently addressed these issues and that there's no uh, there's no reason for you to expect that those previous issues might affect their implementation of the grant going forward. Of course, in and again, I mentioned this just a moment ago, but in addition to checking up on uh, your subgrantees, you need to do a self-check. So do your numbers properly add up? So, you know, I've worked at an intermediary. We've had, you know, sometimes 50, 60 folks on an application. And it is hard to sometimes make sure that all of those numbers make sense and are aligned and all of that. So you want to be sure that you're doing a check uh, of yourself uh, when it comes to submitting that overall application. You want to be sure that you've addressed all of the factors properly. You want to ensure that you've uh, filled in all of the columns and where narratives are requested or, or required or even where, where it's optional if there are places like that you want to be sure that you're completing narratives where there's an opportunity to do so, so that HUD can, so that you give your agencies the best and most fair shake at having a, a strong application. And then finally, please make sure that you submit your application on time. So moving on, um, I want to just mention a couple of accounting things, uh, as well as some non-accounting things that maybe you might have not included in your previous administration of the application part of the grant life cycle but that are a good idea to pay attention to going forward. So the, uh, uh, the Form 424, which is the detailed budget um, that you'll submit to HUD that covers actual documentable cumulative and quarterly administrative costs. Um, these are things such as uh, personnel or direct labor, labor, travel, supplies, those sort of things. Um, when you're looking at your budget and when you're looking at the budgets that your subgrantees are submitting to you, you want to take a look and compare and contrast what are different, what different subgrantees are proposing to provide and at what cost. So uh, when you're looking at the budget of agencies who are providing the same services, do the number of units and staff and personnel expenses, do, do they sort of correlate a little bit? Are the budgets close or is there some sort of huge variation between the two agencies? If there is variation that is, you know, significant, this could mean, it doesn't necessarily mean, but it could mean that HUD's not getting enough value uh, for the same services from one agency versus the other. Or it could mean, again, that, you know, someone's promising the world on a shoestring, on a shoestring budget. So if the value uh, of the services looks too good to be true, again, it's too cheap for the, for the amount of units that they're, that they're promising. That's something that you just want to double back on because usually when something's too good to be true, it probably seems too good to be true. It probably is. Um, you also want to take a look at if you have a, a, a research division or uh, if you have enough staff at your over, as an oversight agency, you want to take the opportunity to help agencies identify areas where, they're, where they can have cost savings, especially if their budget is, is really huge. Um, and then in terms of just some non-accounting tips, and we'll go into this a little bit more on the next slide, um, but your application this year uh, includes, uh, includes the 9906 chart B and chart G. Um, and I'm going to talk about how you can use these, these charts separately and in conjunction to, again, help guide you throughout your grant administration. Uh, before, I go, uh, before I talk about these, I just want to mention that uh, every year with the NOFA, the charts can change. Um, and just because charts are represented in a certain way in one NOFA doesn't mean they'll be represented the same way in the next year's NOFA. So on your screen, you see 9906 chart G and chart B. Chart B describes counseling activities to be provided across your network. So, and this lets you as an oversight agency know how your service portfolio is shaped. So, uh, for instance, you may have a lot of pre-purchase counseling. You may have a lot of 
uh, fair, fair housing related activities, you may have a lot of default delinquency, you may have a lot of rental counseling. Um, either way, this chart not only lets you know uh, sort of how your portfolio is shaped in terms of counseling, act counseling education activities, but it also lets you know how those activities will be provided. So for example, one-on-one -on -one counseling, group education, in-person counseling. You should use chart B to figure out where you have strong opportunities to provide uh, quality services to clients, but technical assistance, but also technical assistance to your network. So for example, if you have a lot of pre-purchase, then you need to be looking to say, you know, as I'm filling out Chart C, which we're going to get to in just a second here, uh, I want to be sure that some of those services are some of my oversight services and technical support, and even my performance monitoring, that those are geared towards uh, pre-purchase counseling, because that's the largest part of my portfolio, if you will. Uh, and then uh, finally, this last point on Chart G, um, Chart G is used as a self-check for you. So you'll recall in the last in the last uh, webinar, we talked about network monitoring, and you're supposed to have a quality control plan. Well, Chart G is your chance to tell HUD all about how you are going to do wonderful implementation of your quality control plan and really provide uh, robust monitoring and oversight and support for your agency, uh, for your networks, your, your network agencies. And so what you want to do is ask yourself a couple of questions. You know, given the administrative fee that I'm asking HUD for, are the activities I'm describing in, in Chart G, are those sufficient? Are they, are they robust enough? Are they appropriate? Did I cover everything that I said I would do in my quality control plan that I've submitted to HUD? Um, and are my activities an appropriate use of HUD, of HUD funds um, in terms of, you know, should I be doing more? And then finally, as I mentioned, you want to use uh, Chart and chart G uh, as opportunities to sort of look at them together and see do they, uh, are, are your oversight and management and grant activities, are they matching, uh, what, what, are they matching the needs given the services that your network agencies are going to be provided as listed in part, as listed in chart G. So with that, I am going to pass it to Jason who, who uh, may have some additional uh, specific examples for this. Thank you, Aisha. And if we can uh, just step back to that graphic for just a second. Um, really, I think what's important is to recognize that this cross view can be valuable, particularly if you consider that not all administrators either write or regularly re revisit their grant applications. The charts show oversight and housing counseling items that are related to service delivery the intersection of that information can guide how an administrator will approach supporting the housing counseling agencies. If you've got an agency that's performing high concentrations of pre-purchase counseling, something that would be noted on chart B, you might decide to provide training webinars or sponsor subgrantee counselors to attend training on pre-purchase counseling. You might observe pre uh, you may observe pre pre purchase counseling sessions during your site visit to ensure consistency with best practices and compliance requirements. So consider knowing the services that are provided, both that are provided as well as services that are not provided, that define the activity in your markets and how it will align with their work plans and how reviewing these can help in rectifying service delivery deficiencies. Thank you. So lastly, in step one, we want to examine uh, that you review the key items from booth management webinars that are concerning accounting to help you have a robust application that meaningfully addresses HUD's requirements and expectations for financial management. Booth management covers the financial cycle, budgets, certifications, disclosures, reporting, and acceptable practices. And at this time, I'd like to ask HUD if they have anything to add on this. Hi, this is Stephanie Williams. And, and I, I thought one of the things that, that we could um, 
that I could just highlight is sort of tying together the NOFA application and um, oversight and monitoring. Right now we are at the end of the fiscal year 14 um, grant. People are, are submitting their, their final reports for the for the expenditure of the 14 funds. And one of the ways that the NOFA application um, charts came into, into um, play with the reporting uh, is the affirmatively furthering fair housing chart, for example. When we ask you to let us know what the um, activity for meeting your goals was that you reported in that HUD 9906 chart. So um, although we are not in the heart of a NOFA application process right now, this is still um, very relevant because it all kind of comes full, full circle when you look at the grant cycle. The application process and, and how you will perform the housing counseling activities throughout the performance period and then reporting on um, what you've entered in your, your grant application at the end of the performance period in your final report, your final quarterly report to HUD. So um, that's just an example of how um, it's, it's important to kind of key in on the activities that you, you plan to do in your application. Um, and how they will need to be um, updated as a, a part of your final report. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. Shauna, do we have any questions on this section or can we keep moving forward to step two? Uh, no written questions. Chantel, does anyone want to rate, um, ask a question verbally? No, no hands are raised. Okay, great. Oh, sorry. Okay, great. Well, hopefully that means this is really this uh, presentation is really clear. So, okay, let's go on to step two. And um, what I want to say is that step two, three, and four are listed consecutively, but they actually happen in concert. Um, step two of the grant administration life cycle and step four go hand in hand. And then step three is where you document the results of uh, sort of implementing steps two and four in an integrated fashion. So step two is the award, um, and the award is simply when HUD, uh, when HUD awards the money to the oversight agency known as the grantee in the grant agreement. Um, and then step two might also include the grantee or the oversight agency making a sub-award, uh, well, it will include making a sub-award to, to the sub-grantees. But once, it, once you as a, as a grantee or oversight agency receive the award from, uh, from HUD, uh, the very next thing that you should be doing, uh, because you, let me just step back for a moment and say you probably won't get to the penny, the exact amount that you asked for. So the next step that you want to do is say, okay, given this uh, award uh, and you know, I need to figure out how does this reshape what my sub-awards uh, were and what, what agencies will get compared to what they asked. And so uh, we won't go into this slide for a couple of slides, but when you get to step four, you want to say, all right, how are we going to adjust our production and, uh, and our budget given the award that we actually received? What I want to say about this is that, you know, between the application and the time you actually get some money, a lot of things can change because several months pass. Sometimes, you know, folks uh, lose staff. Um, you know, they may have had a, a significant increase or decrease in the amount of services sought. Um, they may have gotten some money that they weren't sure they were going to get, or maybe some money that they, they, they thought they would get uh, as part of their leveraged funds. Um, maybe they didn't actually get that. And so um, those are all things that you need to be looking at. Um, and these are examples of why it's really important before you go to HUD and say, here is what... Uh, here's what our budget's going to be, and here is the adjusted uh, unit production. That's why it's so key that you, that you talk to your sub-grantees and have that conversation to see if any other factors have changed uh, what they initially anticipated of being able to produce under the grant. And then finally, uh, you also want to be, uh, you also want to do the same checks that, that I described in step one. 
So do the, do the projections make sense, again, in the context of the award amount that they are given? So for example, if I'm at a small housing counseling agency and you know I promise to do a certain amount of units and I have three counselors, and then between the application and the award, I've lost two counselors that I haven't replaced, am I telling you that I'm still going to be able to produce the same number of units with just one counselor? That, that wouldn't really make sense. And so, uh, again, it's not saying that it's impossible, but if that's the type of promise that I'm, going, that I'm willing to, to make, then you as an oversight agency need to be checking in with me uh, to see how exactly I plan to do that. Okay, we can move on to step three. Thank you. So uh, step three is the grant agreement. And again, we'll get to step four um, in, a, in just a moment. But the grant agreement is, uh, again, that's the agreement between you as a grantee or oversight agency and HUD, as well as uh, the sub-grant agreement, if you use them, uh, between you and your network agencies or your, your sub-grantees and your network agencies. Uh, so I'm just going to talk. Uh, the, the grant agreement is pretty straightforward. You read it, you sign it, and then you live up to what you said you'd do. Um, but I am going to give you just a couple of tips here that I that, that we think will help make the grant implementation pretty smooth. Um, so when you get the grant agreement, if you, uh, you definitely want to, even if you're not using sub-grant agreements, you you want to take the opportunity to go through um, the requirements and expectations that you're going to have uh, with your sub-grantees. So that means having some sort of a, a session or a phone call or, or something that ensures that your sub-grantees and the grant administrators, grant administrators at those programs, program managers, or what have you, uh, understand what's expected of, of you and, uh, in turn, expected of them under the HUD Comprehensive Counseling Grant. Uh, in addition, if, uh, if sub-grant agreements are used, you want to be sure that they mirror, to the extent uh, appropriate, the HUD's grant agreement with the oversight agency. Uh, you want to. This means clearly identifying the sub-award amount as well as the required uh, production and compliance uh, that's required for the grant, um, as well as the oversight method that uh, that agencies will be subjected to as part of their participation in the in the grant. Um, another tip: be specific in what your in your grant agreement. So we talked about step two uh, covering the award and step four covering the projected budget in units. And so I always like to tell folks, if you know, for example, if an agency says they're going to do 100, uh, 100 units for $100 over the course of four quarters, then the sub-grant agreement should reflect this expectation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I've even uh, gone to the extent of saying, well, you know, by, 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 mid, by midway, by quarter two, for example, uh, you, you know, I want you to have 50% of your units expended uh, so that that way if there's going to be a shortfall, I can figure out what, you know, what, what I need to do, how I need to reallocate the units so that I can, number one, avoid funding recapture and avoid sort of that last minute rush and, and what, what just feels like a lot of pressure at the end of the grant cycle to try to, to, try to push through for units. Um, you know, the, you know, Oversight agencies have the right to, to sort of, you know, ask agencies to expend their funds uh, expediently over the course of the grant. Um, and if, a, if an agency doesn't expend their units like that, perhaps uh, they have grants that happen in, in cycles and, and their, produ their production all comes in the fourth quarter, that's okay too. Just make sure that you have a, a conversation with that agency so that you're not stuck in quarter three, pulling out your hair, wondering why they haven't produced units. So this is about communication and then documenting the results of that communication. Um, and again, you don't have to use a sub-grant agreement, uh, but you do want to be sure that some way, somehow, you have memorialized uh, the, what, you, what you said, uh, you've memorialized what that, what that agency said they would do, or better yet, the services that HUD is purchasing from, from them for a given dollar amount. So if we go into step four, um, we already discussed this. Again, that's when you, uh, step four is when you actually submit the modified budget and projected counseling and education units to HUD. Um, there, there would necessarily probably be some reallocation 
from what you initially promised in your application. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this other than to say what I've, what I've already said. Have, uh, be sure you have conversations with your subgrantees and that everyone is on the same page. And then also in completing step four, remember to just think you know, long, longer term. Uh, what are the things that can happen during the grant administration uh, implementation cycle? So, you know, reallocation of funds, um, you know, leveraged funds, uh, you know, if funds are expected to be extended for other grants, um, you know, are there opportunities for additional production uh, in one area that, that the HUD grant might cover? Those are the types of things that you um, want to be sure that you're covering. The next slide uh, is a graphic graphical representation of the relationship that I just described between steps two, three, and four. And so, uh, again, step step uh, step one is that's the grant that's the application part. That's when HUD tells you and everyone else uh, what their funding methodology is, what the the factors and decision criteria are, and that's when you as a grantee are are completing the application and they're um, submitting it to you. And then you can see very clearly the relationship between steps two, three, and four. And so step two, the award, they tell you what you're going to get. Um, you, you tell the subgrantees what they're going to get or what you're proposing to give them. Uh, and you're having those step two and step three are, I'm sorry, step two and step four are really iterative. And so you're going back and forth. Can you do this for the amount that we're saying we're going to give you? And then finally, step three is where those things are memorialized. Um, so with that, I want to pause and ask HUD, do you have anything to add before I go on to grant reporting? Not at this time for me. Uh, yes, I will. This is Carolyn Hogan, and I will come in on the sub uh, grant agreements. Yes, they are required. Okay. So uh, I stand corrected. Thank you, Carolyn, that you are required to have a, an, a formal subgrant agreement with your housing counseling uh, subgrantees. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, so if we move on to step five of uh, the grant life cycle, let's talk just a, a couple of moments about grant reporting. And so grant reporting involves the, the sort of critical and defining activities you see on there. Um, let's just go through them really quickly. You have to upload your 9902. You have to submit your expenses as well as documentation of those expenses. You have to submit a narrative uh, with your final report, that is. Uh, and then you would submit documentation of your personnel activities, even though we're not calling them a, a PARS. Um, and uh, I want to note here that also Remember that quarterly reports must be provided even if there is no uh, draw request that, that, that's been submitted, so uh, no, no payment that's, that's being requested. And so just a couple of tips uh, around this. Um, you really want to use your quarterly reporting, your 9902, as, a, as an opportunity to, uh, to ensure that what you promised way back in step one that in, and in those charts, um, and Stephanie just highlighted this, you know, chart G and, and uh, chart B and, and everything else that, that you've written to your application. When you're turning in your, your, your grant report, you want to be going through them and saying, are we on track to, to do what we said we would do? Um, and, and are things happening in a way that, that looks compliant. You want to look for red flags. Again, uh, we talked about this at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, are people doing things that, that you know, aren't in their work plan or that we, we didn't apply for, that they're not HUD approved to provide? Um, those are key questions you want to ask. Um, you know, are the, the supporting documentations, again, uh, do they meet the requirements that are uh, outlined uh, in the omni um, circulars as they as they relate to uh, financial documentation. Um, another thing that you want to do is you want to take the opportunity to evaluate uh, the performance that you're getting. Uh, and so when we talk about performance evaluation, this means taking a look at the reporting data 
and, and taking the opportunity to ask some key questions. Um, so, for example, you know, am I seeing trends in a particular type of counseling, such as rental counseling? Um, you know, if so, that tells me a couple of things. Maybe I can be looking for uh, some additional grant opportunities, uh, you know, throughout the fiscal year that would support uh, the provision of more uh, uh, rental counseling, uh, because that's what seems to be the demand. Uh, that might also inform what, you know, how, what kinds of agencies that I might seek out you know, in future NOFAs or in future uh, grant opportunities, um, maybe I want to have more rental counseling agencies as sub-grantees in the future because that seems to be where the consumer needs are. Um, the other thing that you want to do is you want to take a look and see, uh, you know, are there, you know, are there compliance concerns? Um, if if the reporting documents don't look right, uh, are there, is this maybe the time to provide a refresher webinar on, uh, you know, on how to provide proper reporting documentation so that when it's time for audits, uh, you know, hopefully everybody has, has, is properly prepared and, and has been properly reminded uh, of what they need to be doing. And then, um, you know, of course, you want to be looking to see where are there opportunities based on maybe narrative that you get at the end of the year or conversations, ongoing communication you have, challenges people are having. Are there opportunities for technical assistance just to help people? Uh, what I like to what I like to say is master their craft in counseling. So, um, are people struggling a bit with pre-purchase counseling, or just having some questions that some some good technical assistance may um, may help? Okay, Jason for step six. Thanks, Aisha. So now we'll look at t uh, step six. And as mentioned before, your ELOX is the primary grant and subsidy uh, disbursement system that handles the disbursements and cash management for the majority of the HUD grant programs. As it relates to the grant reporting, um, within the ELOX, your payment request from the oversight agencies is used to pay the agencies for their oversight activities and to pay to subgrantees based on their reports and their payment requests. So subgrantees don't actually access the ELOX. ELOX are accessed only by um, the oversight agency. And things that the OA should do uh, to strengthen the implementation of the ELOX activities are as follows. If you're having problems with your ELOX access, you should contact your HUD POC for assistance. Working within the ELOX is often a function of the accounting department at an OA. So this doesn't mean that the grant administrator shouldn't be familiar with ELOX and how the, the, the grant funds are being expended. So to be an effective grant administrator at an oversight agency, you have to maintain a dialogue with the accounting department or whoever's responsible for ELOC, uh, ELOC activity and know what's going on with the ELOX and the information that's contained within it. Remember, only registered ELOC users and approved officials can access the system. And as a grant administrator, if you don't have access to ELOX, you will want to maintain communications with whomever is the approving official and ELOC user to make sure that you are effectively managing your grant. So now what you're going to find here is that we have three screenshots that are going to overlay a sample of information that can be obtained from the ELOC system. So if you haven't seen these screens before, this should be the initiating point for you to talk to the accounting entities that have been that are managing this. So as we look at this, what you'll see um, with all three of the shots, and you can advance them now. We have a budget shot. It breaks out an assortment of operation and management uh, improvement expenditures and the amounts and the dates that are being identified. 
So the budget and voucher observations are not just an accounting function. They're a tool for the grant administrator to manage the grant. By examining the ELOCS pages, an administrator can explore the amounts, the breakdowns, the dates of allocations, all to inform when expenses may be drawn down, how that can influence ongoing and future expenses, and areas to provide more support. In these graphics, here what we can see is um, the snapshots of operations and management improvement segments and when these items were dispersed. You may want to consider what allocations are listed here and how that weaves into your management approach. Consider how you establish your training or uh, identifying new client management system protocols or, or platform technology platforms that you might use or any marketing support that would align with timing and goals. By looking at your ELOC system, this can help you start to identify what you've done in the past and what you'll want to do in the future. And before we move on, I'd also like to ask if HUD would like to have anything to add to the ELOCs dialogue before we move on. This is Carolyn Hogan's, and I would just uh, like to reemphasize what you've said already, that if the agencies are having any problems accessing the ELOC system to contact their point of contact. Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn. Great. Do we have any questions, Shauna, before I get started on the, the last chunk of this? There are no written questions. Chantal, are there any hands raised? No hands are raised. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so the final step uh, in the grant life cycle, step seven, uh, is performance reviews. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like you can just breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, I got my final report in, and oh my goodness, I'm done. Uh, but as we know, um, it, it seems like just when you start getting busy with other stuff, it seems like you get uh, a no you get notification that. Uh, either you as an oversight agency are going to be audited or receive a performance review, um, or you get notification that one of your subgrantee agencies are going to receive a performance review or audit. So I just want to uh, add a, a, a point of clarification when we talk about critical defining activities under performance reviews. Uh, so audits involve a, a formal review of an oversight agency or a network agency that can result in a finding related to, to regulatory or statutory violation of a HUD program. So again, a formal finding related to some regulation or, or a statutory violation of the HUD program. Performance reviews uh, are, oh, let me actually back up even more and say an audit is, when we, when we say audit, we're talking about a lot of times a, usually a financial audit, um, and we are talking about an activity that's usually we're going to talk about a third-party auditor. So for instance, booth management might be coming in and doing a financial audit uh, of your files and auditing other things uh, that, that are related to the grant, the implementation of the grant program. When we talk about performance reviews, we're talking about a, a couple of categories of things. There are performance reviews that HUD can conduct, and those are similar to an audit in that HUD can issue you a formal uh, finding, if you will, that can result in your program being suspended or removed from the program even. Um, and then we're also talking about, oh, and uh, those, those ones conducted by HUD uh, include the 9910. So they're going to be using the HUD form 9910. Uh, performance reviews also refer to the things that you as an oversight agency will, will be doing. So again, uh, you'll remember at the beginning we talked about um, the different types of network monitoring. And one of those types of network monitoring were periodic reviews, uh, which is when you go and you do either a, a full formal uh, remote review of, of an agency files and, and other programmatic and administrative documents, uh, or you go on site and, and do that same thing. That's a formal performance review. The difference between your performance reviews and HUD's performance reviews is that uh, your performance reviews, for them to rise to a level of a finding, you really then have to go through HUD and tell HUD what your observations 
and concerns are as they pertain to a particular network agency and then go from there. So now that we've just clarified a, a couple of those things, um, what I, there's a couple of things I want to just focus on here. Um, and we mentioned this in the network monitoring webinar. Uh, uh, can we go back uh, just one slide? Yeah, I'm sorry. And we also have a question on eLocks too. So um, okay. I apologize. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, uh, sure, OK. I'll wrap this up if, if that's OK, and then we'll get right to that. Yeah, question. I'm sorry. Um, and so when we're talking about uh, 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 performance reviews that are conducted by HUD, you as an oversight agency are expected to, or a third party from HUD, you as an oversight agency are expected to provide support to your agency. So um, we talked about not going in and overwhelming the agency by doing your own performance review because now you've received notice from HUD or a third party that they're going to do an audit or review of the agency. Uh, so don't go in and say, okay, now we have to do our own full performance review. What you do want to do is help to make sure that they're adequately prepared, they know what to expect, uh, they have their files in order, um, and that you're able to help answer any questions and, and clarify as needed um, with HUD, uh, for example, you know, the types of things that they'll be looking at. That's what it means to be supportive. Um, and remember, grant documents and client files are subject, are subject to being audited um, or reviewed up to three years following the fiscal year. Um, so even if no one gets audited or reviewed during the grant cycle, remember, you still need to be staying on top of those things. You as an oversight agency can continue to uh, conduct reviews of uh, activities conducted in past years, and it's even a good idea to do that. So that way, if you get that notice in the future, everyone's ready um, and, and you got the best performance possible. Okay, great. Thank you, Shauna. Oh, no problem. And so before you go on to the summary chart, um, so this is on ELOCs. Um, is ELOCs set up per grant organization, or is it general to all organizations? Uh, the ELOC system is set up, well, regarding the HUD grant, it's set up uh, per grant, per grant, per organization. I think that's the best way for me to answer that's that a, question. Yes. And Thank if you. it's not clear, let me know and I can try to explain further. Great. So as we begin the last part of this presentation, I just want to review some steps. Um, what you see here on the next two slides are the seven life cycle steps um, as they are implemented by each by each respective party. So HUD, the oversight agency, or the sub grantees. And so in step one, you can see that's the application as a reminder. HUD creates and reviews the application based on the uh, criteria and policies that, that the Office of Housing Counseling has set forth. Um, the oversight agency, or the grantee, is responsible for compiling and submitting the application on behalf of the network. And the subgrantee's role in this is to be sure that you provide all of the information and qualifications that the grantee needs to submit a strong application. Uh, and step two, that's the grant award. HUD makes the award to, uh, announces the award to the oversight agency in this, in this case. They appoint the the GTM or the GTR, um, you as an oversight agency adjust your sub awards and activities. And again, you do that in conversation with your sub grantees. And uh, I want to mention here that for the sub grantee part, sometimes they may they may decline the award because it's not it's not enough money um, or something else happened that you know makes them unable to use those funds. Uh, and so. If that happens, or if for some reason you as an oversight agency think, you know, gosh, based on my conversations with my subgrantees, I'm not sure that we'll be able to extend these funds, the time to have that conversation with your HUD point of contact is at that moment and not when you're unable to extend the funds and, and you're about to have your funds recaptured. So I do want to highlight that point. Um, just moving forward quickly here, uh, step three, that's the grant agreement. Um, I want to reiterate. Uh, that the, the sub-grant agreements are required. Uh, so just as HUD issues you a grant agreement, you issue and have signed sub-grant agreements with your sub-grantees, um, and the sub-grantees sign it and, and live up to those expectations 
just as you live up to the expectations in your agreement. Step four, the projected budget and units. We talked about that and what needs to happen there. Uh, step five, the reporting. Uh, we talked quite a bit about that as well. Um, one thing that I did want to note, just uh, as an aside for unfunded affiliates, um, they are required to, to do reporting and, and upload the, the 9902 as well. So we won't get into uh, the details of that, but just know that just because uh, you're not funded under a particular HUD grant, you still have to go in and do reporting if you're a HUD-approved housing counseling agency um, and, and, and if you're uh, a part of a network or, or even if you're not a part of a network. Uh, so, the, so the agencies in your network would submit their reports and their 9902s and other, other related documents. Um, on the next slide, uh, just covering uh, that's six and seven, uh, we talked about ELOCs. Uh, HUD will review the, the payments from the oversight agencies. Um, the oversight agencies, they're going to you know, assemble the vouchers for HUD, keep record of expenses, the client management systems, all, all of the things that um, support uh, what you're what you're uh, submitting through the ELOC system. Um, and then the subgrantee, again, you are keeping records of activities and all of those things. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you, as an oversight agency, are accountable for the subgrantees, and the subgrantees are not at all relieved of their requirements and responsibilities just because you are overseeing them. Um, and then finally, in step seven, the performance reviews. Uh, we talked that we talked about HUD or a third party conducting a formal performance review or a financial audit. Uh, we talked about the oversight agencies um, being responsible for providing a su support to agencies that are re receiving a performance review or audit, as well as conducting their own performance reviews to make sure that that everything is is in compliance and providing technical support um, to make sure that when there is a formal performance review or audit. Um, that, that if there were any issues, those things are, are resolved ahead of time. Um, and then again here, this is an area where I want to note that even if someone is not funded, it does not mean that they are not subject, they are not subject to receive an audit or performance review. Um, so to that end, the last piece uh, here on this column is that everyone in your network, funded and unfunded affiliates, need to be sure that they are self-monitoring, and that they are uh, performing corrective actions in response to any quality or compliance issues that are raised by you as an oversight agency, HUD, or one of HUD's designated third parties. Thanks, Aisha. So here we have uh, some of the common grant implementation mistakes. So we want to try to make sure that you avoid these errors as you work through each one of the seven grant life cycle steps. So it starts with grant documents that are required in the grant agreement that may not be returned to the POC. Your HUD 424 budget not adding up to the grant amounts, leverage funds not being included, and other expenses not detailed on separate sheets. Uh, reports that are not uh, signed by the authorizing officials, and funds not expended within grant agreement periods of performance. So in all, remember this presentation is part of a robust suite of offerings on grant administration and oversight agencies and the network agencies are responsible for reviewing and complying with all of the resource materials. And you should be reaching out to your point of contact as needed. So with that, um, before we move forward, I'd like to ask HUD if they have any additional comments to offer. Yes, this is Carolyn Hogan. I just want to mention about, I was stated earlier, some, some information about recaptures. And I would just like to remind the agencies that if they learn early on in the grant period or whenever they learn that they are not going to be able to use all of, all of the grant funds, to notify their point of contact so we can move forward on recapturing them and hopefully be able to use them for other things. Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn. And I wanted to mention this is something that, that we, we say each time we give a, a training on the grant agreement. One of the, the common mistakes is not reading the grant agreement, which is not meant to sound facetious, but um, 
the, the trainings that we offer are helpful, but does, they do not get into the level of um, detail and nuance sometimes that is outlined in the, in the grant agreement itself. So um, it really is important to not only read the grant agreement in its entirety when it's sent, but also to use it as a reference. And particularly, um, there is information in the reporting section that's that's very helpful and that's hard to remember off the top of one's head. So that's that's really a reference section as well, the reporting section, and um, the uh, the payment section when when requesting reimbursement, and uh, of course the the sub the sub granting or subcontract section of the of the grant agreement. So. Um, that's that's one thing in terms of a, of a common mistake, kind of having information right before you that you may not always reference um, frequently enough. And the other thing is uh, is sharing the grant agreement with the appropriate people within the agency. That might be the finance or accounting person, not just kind of the the counselors and the um, the, the program managers, but so that the the folks who were involved with um, with accounting or or compliance or however an agency is um, is organized, just making sure that everyone is in everyone um, relevant relevant persons, I should say, are uh, really kept abreast of the requirements of the grant agreement. Thank you, Stephanie. So now we're going to take a poll and we are going to continue to open uh, the floor to any questions uh, as we go along. We'd actually like to target some of the technical assistance on this topic. And so what we would like to know is where do you need the most help with the steps that have been discussed to this point? Uh, what steps present the greatest challenges to your agency? Is it one, application, two, award, grant agreement, and budget, the preliminary steps two through four, number three, grant reporting, four, ELOCs and drawdowns, or five, performance reviews. So we'll start by leaving the poll open, and um, I will turn it back to see, uh, Shauna, are there any questions that we need to answer with HUD right now? There are no written questions right now, Chantel? No hands are raised. Oh, of course. <laughs> Let's take a second. Okay, now I have a question. Grant reporting, specifically billing requests by agencies. Would love to see best practices um, on how other intermediaries handle and bill. Sorry. So I guess it's just a shout out to uh, like to know how other agencies are doing it. So uh, related to billing requests. So does any uh, HUD staff or um, Jason or Aisha want to offer anything related to billing requests and how best to handle? I would still make it. I think that's a good point. And uh, in terms of, of, of general formatting for for billing, I mean, we are uh, uh, trying to look at you know what we might be able to provide, uh, you know, as a toolkit to to help agencies see uh, uh, sort of a general thing uh, in terms of how to you know a general way to how to how to bill. So. Um, uh, you know, we will provide uh, information in a, in a toolkit format as we go forward. Yeah, I would just uh, underscore as well that um, there that uh, there will be some some toolkits and other supportive things related to all of the webinars uh, today's webinar included um, to to address some of those very questions, uh, so be on the lookout for that. And then also don't forget to visit uh, Office of Housing and Counseling's website. Uh, Bill talked about 
uh, you know, and I've talked about some toolkits that are going to be coming out. There are very many things on a website of the Office of Housing Counseling's website uh, that are useful for answering those types of questions. Um, you know, as police see continues to to move forward and and, and evolve, all of us uh, in that area. Okay, great. I think we're ready for the poll results. Excellent. Thank you. So um, at this point, I would uh, like to give HUD an opportunity to respond on these. It appears that approximately 17% of the respondents had identified that application uh, represents one of their greatest challenges. The award, grant agreement, and budget uh, came in at 14%. The largest grouping was under grant reporting at 34%. ELOCs and drawdowns was at 10%, and performance reviews was at 24%. So we led with grant reporting and performance reviews. Uh, HUD, would you like to offer any feedback on these? Hi, this is Bill again. I just want to say that this is very useful uh, uh, feedback. Uh, obviously, it uh, seems like grant reporting is an area where uh, where folks would like to see uh, uh, have to have difficulties and maybe would like some additional guidance. As I indicated, we will be having uh, 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 some some uh, uh, additional uh, uh, webinar about the uh, uh, you know the grant agreements themselves, and, and we are looking towards providing more information on how to be helpful in terms of grant reporting. So this is good to know, and uh, uh, and I also see uh, performance reviews are up there, and 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 our our oversight folks have, have been busy in, in terms of trying to uh, come up with ways to streamline and to and to make it more user friendly and understandable for for uh, the industry, and, and they're going to continue to do that. So you should see more coming out. You know, in, in, in the months uh, ahead. Thank you, Bill. Any others? I uh, no further questions that are written. Chantal, did anyone raise their hand? No hands are raised at this time. Excellent. Well, thank you all for the the input on this. And um, uh, at this point, we'll actually start to bring you to some of the remaining tools that uh, are available to you to help support a lot of the activities that you're doing. So, as it has been mentioned, a lot of the resources that you're now seeing are both uh, uh, some are identified on HUD.gov and also on the HUD Exchange. The booth management webinar was just recently held on April 21st of this year. The presentation provided was uh, meant to complement their presentation, so if you have not reviewed uh, their audio recordings or looked at the, um, the webinar, we'd recommend that you do so uh, after today's webinar. While many of these uh, uh, Office of Housing Counseling resources are not yet on the HUD Exchange website, uh, a few of them already are, such as the 424 form uh, information. And as part of the capacity building toolkits, there is one on performance reviews, which was one of the areas that y'all just identified a need for more information on. In particular, you may want to observe uh, what you find on pages 19 through 23 of that um, uh, link that defines performance reporting pitfalls. Okay, before we move on, um, there is uh, one person with their hand raised, so we might have some questions um, that she would like to ask. Chantel, do you want to unmute her? Might be related to these OMB tools, Jason. Okay. Tammy, you've been unmuted.
Did we scare her away? <laughs> Okay, maybe that may, maybe she didn't have a question. <laughs> okay, I guess mute her again. <laughs> Why don't you continue with the resources, Jason? Thank you, Shauna. And then lastly, uh, you'll notice that there are some additional webinar point of contact and other resources. These will be helpful in shaping the quality of your grant administration plan. Uh, as well as provide appended tools and other resources. So we recommend that you observe and print these webinars and any of the documents uh, that you find on the exchange that will support your knowledge base. Note that the Bridge newsletter featured uh, slide information on the point of contact feedback. So that covers a newly launched initiative called the Central Point of Contact for Complaints and Compliments. Phyllis Ford is the main point of contact for this area, and it includes the following types of feedback. Performance review findings, communication issues, reporting and grant payment problems, and regulation and policy interpretation. The HUD Housing Counseling Listserv Archives is a great place to check to ensure you're up to date on the latest news, announcements, and trainings available on the program. So we recommend that you uh, put that as, as a favorite uh, in your access points. And know that the HUD.gov website is migrating to the HUD Exchange this summer. More information is coming, and you can start by signing in as a user in the interim. Okay, great. Do we have any um, final questions, or did Tammy come back? Tammy, we would love to hear from you. Um, there are no written questions at this point, but we'll hold for a couple of minutes. Um, we do want to make sure that you understand how important it is that we receive your evaluation on this webinar. Um, so we provided the link here. The link will be available for 10 or so minutes after the end of the webinar for you to copy and paste it into your browser. But it's, um, it's, it's your feedback to us to make sure that we're constantly improving these webinars and giving you what you need. And um, we, of course, provided the HUD.gov housing counseling website, as well as uh, the email box for any of your questions at housing.counseling at HUD.gov. Um, maybe HUD would like to say some parting uh, words while I see if I, um, I do have one question, I'm sorry, that was just written in. Um, and then we'll pass it over to HUD. Will intermediaries need to have a staff person obtain a housing counseling certification once the proposed rule is finalized? So will intermediaries need to have a staff person obtain a, housing, a HUD housing counseling certification once the proposed rule is finalized? Bill, would you like to take this one? Uh, sure. I mean, we're still working on the um on how it's all going to uh, work out operationally. So uh, we'll, we'll have a lot more information coming out as we move forward. Um, I, I, I can only say we are, we are taking a look at how it's going to be implemented and, and what the different roles are of, of intermediaries with regard to the certification process and, and versus the roles of the, the, you know, their, their some grantees and, and affiliates. So, uh, all I can say is there's going to be more information to come. I don't have any specific information at this point in time. Okay, great. So stay tuned. Thanks for asking that question. That's the last one that was written in. Chantel, does anyone have their hand up or want to ask anything publicly? No, no hands are raised. Okay, great. Any parting words from uh, Stephanie, Bill, um, Carolyn? Well, this is Carolyn, and I would just like to say, uh, as we always say, thank you to the agencies for participating in HUD's Housing Counseling Program. And I'll, and I'll add that the, the training today was in response to um, feedback that we had gotten that more guidance was needed by, um, by intermediaries. And so, um, to the extent that you feel, and I think the poll, re poll results show this, 
um, information on even more specific areas like the grant reporting and the performance reviews, the more uh, detail that you can provide about um, what information is missing and what would be helpful, the better we can try to come up with um, training and, and guidance to address those things. So thank you to, um, to the folks who organized us today and presented this information. Okay, great. Well, thanks. thank you, everyone, for participating. And we will leave the SurveyMonkey link for the evaluation up here for a few more minutes so you can provide us your feedback. Um, have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much.